the things console on. Glad you made it, glad you found it, even though I know it's not always easy to find this office. Um, thanks to Mozilla for hosting us here, this is amazing. Um, I just screwed up something in the event uh, invite, so I'm glad you found the right floor and everything. Um, I don't know, how many of you have been to ThingsCon events before, or have been to any ThingsCon anything before? Like a third? That's awesome. How did the rest of you find us? Eventbrite. Eventbrite? People actually look at Eventbrite, that's awesome. <laughs> um, we just use it for the ticketing, but that's great. Okay. Cool, so um, let me just mention a few things about ThingsCon. Um, ThingsCon started out as an event around IoT and responsible IoT, and it has grown from one event in Berlin to first two events in Berlin and Amsterdam, and then um, a whole series of, of events all over Europe, essentially, and a few in Asia and Africa and the US, um, where we have a bunch of practitioners from the Internet of Things who think about how to make that work more responsibly. Um, in addition to the events, which are the social backbone to this community, we do some research, we publish a bunch, we do field trips to China, we you know, publish essay collections from people in the field. There is one coming up this fall called uh, responsible, uh, The State of Responsible IoT. Uh, there's also going to be a, another trip to China later in the, in the year. I'm going to talk about this later a little bit. And um, there's one project in particular that we want to talk about today where we try to take all the things we talk about and turn them into action. And that is a trust mark for the Internet of Things. Um, so I'm going to be sharing a little bit about the status of that project today. In the middle, I'm going to hand on over to Jason Schultz, who is a professor at NYU Law, um, who has worked with the EFF and other uh, relevant uh, organizations in that space. And he's going to you know, dig into like, the legal aspects of what that might mean. Um, and you can find a lot about things on here. But today, it's all about the trust mark for IoT. And I'm just going to... Oh, yeah, also my co-founder, Max, is here. Sorry. Um, hello. Hey, Max. Um, first of all, this is the first time we actually pub uh, publicly, I think, even mention the name of this project. It's called the Trustable Technology Mark. TrustableTech.com is the website that goes with it. Um, I'm very excited that we have a design and a name now, because the trust mark for IoT is not a good name. Um, now we have one. And it's essentially the one sentence thing what we're trying to do is we try to empower consumers to make you know, better informed decisions about what connected devices they buy and also enable companies that want to do the right thing to prove that their connected devices are trustworthy. And that's, uh, that's not tr as trivial as it sounds at all. So we're currently like, you know, roughly three people working on this, not full time, but three people working on this. I'm the project lead. Um, Jason Schultz helps out with the legal stuff and Pete Thomas, who teaches at the University of Dundee, uh, helps with design and strategy. Um, Jason and I are also Mozilla Fellows currently, so we get Mozilla support to make this happen. And why do we need a trust mark at all? Um, the thing is, IoT is mostly black boxes. Everybody who's worked on these, in this field knows it's really hard to find out what devices do, what their capabilities are, what happens. And if I have a device today, like connected through a microphone, I'm not going to use that now, just for the AV team. Um, It'll still be the same after the next software update tomorrow, and chances are it might not be. So people have no way of finding out which device to trust, which not to trust. And that's not an oversight on consumer side. It's just there's no tools to do that yet. And I think there is, um, this is oversimplifying a little, but I think there's four questions that we should always be able to answer for every connected device that we get into our lives. Does it do what I expect it to do? Like, does it function, essentially? Does it do anything I wouldn't expect reasonably? Do, you know, does it also listen to me or listen to the ads I play on my TV and then serve me ads on Facebook later or something? That's not something you'd expect from your TV to do, yet it has happened before in a case of, I think, of Samsung. So, bad idea. Is the organization trustworthy that produces it? That's really hard to figure out, but, like, roughly... Do you kind of trust the people who make it? And is it made using trustworthy processes? Because especially security and privacy is often based on, you know, everything to do with data is often, the processes have to be right in order for the outcome to be right. Um, and usually we can't really answer these questions currently. And so we're trying to um, launch this mark not as a baseline certification, you know, like, you know, from TÜV or the CE mark for, elect for electric goods that weed out just the bad stuff, 
that'll you know light your house on fire, essentially, because that's good at keeping out the crap, and you'll be, you know, you'll have something that's going to be okay. We try to like take the other route, and we try to re to raise the bar at the very top. The companies that are already motivated, that already want to do the right thing, that put in the eff extra effort, you know, security and 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 privacy data. Uh, and, and pri respect for privacy and all the things that make it harder to build a good product and give them a way to show that they do that. And this essentially might be something that only applies to 5% of the products on the market. Might be more, but either way, they're, they're the companies that, that raise the bar and that sets, you know, that, that set a new gold standard for the things we want to see built. So that's where we're coming in. Not by going into a broad approach where we just try the bad stuff, but be very narrow and focus on the on the really high end stuff. Um, and so, there are a few things that we need to get right. First of all, it has to be meaningful. If anyone can just slap it on the product, even if it's like a crap product, not going to help anyone. So that's one thing. That's the obvious one. It also should be, I think, really hard to earn. Like it shouldn't be easy to build. It's never. It, it, it just should be easy, but it's not easy. It's really hard to build a really good product that builds connected services based on you know limited data and good data practices. It's it's really hard to do. Um, but also, we don't want to create a lot of overhead, so it should be easy to apply um, because the companies that are already built good stuff shouldn't also be burdened by overhead. And by overhead, I don't just mean it should be easy to kind of prove that you comply, but also. Uh, it should be free. It should be free to use. We're building this as open source as possible, and we're gonna and this is gonna be free to use uh, forever and for everyone. And we didn't just start with like certification out of nowhere. Um, last year, we wrote a bigger research report on the potential of Trustmark for IoT. We did this together with Mozilla, um, and we had some really nice early feedback. Not just a lot of good feedback, but also it was cited pretty extensively in Brazil's national IoT plan, like the week after it was published. So that was a really nice, nice boost right away. And then we realized, okay, there's something there. We can actually move the needle, even though we're a small team working, you know, part time on this. And so, why should anyone sign up? Like, you're building a product, you're already busy. It's not like people, you know, are building connected devices and have too much time on their hands. Um, and I think it's it's a pretty straightforward pitch that we're that we're taking to uh, the the initial kind of test partners, and it's you know you can prove your commitment to a higher standard, um, and this will increase eventually the trust that users have for you. And by the way, I know there's like a lot of small text here. Um, the thing is, um, the presentation is published, and I'll share the link later. So in case you need the slides, they're available online, um, and. The last, so, so it's you know shows higher commitment. It increases your profile. It increases user trust, and also I believe in an area in an industry that has like a real talent war on. There's not a lot of talent in that space. Um, I think the companies that will attract the best talent are the ones that are you know have like a meaningful work. So I think this is going to help with recruiting a lot. Um, I'm using a Fairphone phone here as an example, just because I think Fairphone goes above and beyond in building extra privacy tools into their to, to sell with their phones like their main thing was to have better more fair sourcing but they go way beyond that and build tools that help you like control your data when at the time when apps didn't do that they've been doing this for like last four years and so how's it gonna work that's like that's where we get into the nitty-gritty and this is a work in progress so um if you see something please you know share share your thoughts on that so we evaluate five key dimensions. We're going to go into this in a second, like which ones they are. It's a, it's a method of self-certification. So there's not going to be a central, centralized authority that gets paid to certify and audit the company for various reasons. Um, not only um, do I think it misaligns incentives if you get paid to certify other people. I think there's a conflict of interest there. But also, it's too slow, especially when Devices, you know, get software updates all the time, so it's not really doable. Um, the approach we take approach we take is that you fill out essentially a questionnaire where you have to answer very deep questions um, that should give you should give users and media like a good idea of like what you're building. Um, 
and that will be fully published. So there's a fully published log file of all the things you've been doing, and they need to be human readable. Um, that's one of the building blocks that I think is really important. It's a very different, non-automated approach in that it's not like a script testing for security. There's like other aspects there that means people need to answer these questions, and then you can hold the company up, you know, standards up against that public commitment. It's going to be decentralized, and it's going to be openly licensed and free to use, as I mentioned, which is pretty much the only one out there, I think, that would take this approach because all the big certification bodies, they're giant and enormous, and they have a lot of overhead, and they charge a lot of money to certify companies. So this is something that um, should make it a lot more attractive to use and that I hope will promote it to get you know um, more traction. The five dimensions we're looking at are privacy and data practices. Like, is this respectful of your privacy? Does it does the company use best data practices? Is it transparent? Does it you know does it mean is it obvious to users what the device does, what the data it collects might be used for? Security is an obvious one. Is it built using best security practices? It's never going to be fully secure, but you know there's ways to make it more secure. Does you know, how open are device and manufacturers? Is open data used or generated? It's just something on a values perspective I think is really open, uh, really important to include. And how stable is the product? Meaning how robust is it? How long a life cycle can we expect? What's the longevity expectation? Does it change? Can it be bricked? Can you use it after the company goes belly up or is sold? Which is something that everybody who's used connected devices has lost devices because they were shut down. And it sucks. It's not okay. And so the way we're doing this is um, the process um, means that the companies fill out these forms, that the documentation gets published, it's freely licensed. So on top of that, we hope that we can like grow a whole ecosystem of, you know, of services that we don't have to build, but developers can build, that media can look at to create rankings, aggregated you know, visuals, comparisons, data visualizations, all kinds of things. Um, and at the core, that's because it's like fully openly licensed. So to sum that up, this is the core project that we're building. And we think there's like more to happen before and after. The core thing is a self-evaluation tool, essentially a glorified um, questionnaire currently. It takes a bunch of questions, say, yes, we do this, we do this, we do this. How do we do this? And then you explain how you do it. If you pass that test, um, first of all, you, you get an evaluation that you can use internally. You can say, okay, we have like some gaps here. We might want to go back to the drawing board. You can do that. It's not yet published. Once you say, okay, we believe we fulfill the conditions, then they can say, okay, we now self-certify. We can now use the trust mark. We publish all the things that we just like typed up, and then they're up for like open uh, scrutiny. Once that's done, other pr third parties could build you know, stuff on top of this um, openly licensed data. But also, I think there could be a whole like, industry just like getting companies ready to do that. That's not what we want to do, but I think it's something that will probably be very helpful down the road. And so the things we, I think, that go into trust is there's some inputs, some process, and some output questions. Like what goes into a product? In textiles, for example, there's a blue sign certification that essentially says, these clothes are made, you know, with like environmentally friendly materials or processes. Um, there's ways to like ask for that in IoT as well. Um, process is like how is it made? Just like fair trade focuses on you know labor practices, um, and and farming practices and sustainability. The same goes for security and IoT. And output, like what does it look like when it's finished? Like the CE mark says, okay, this product fulfills certain AU conditions. It will not burn down your house when you plug it into a, into a power plug. And so that's exactly what you do. You do, go through a self-assessment. You say, okay, we do this. You say, do you follow a security by design, by design practices? Yes, we do. In our context, for the kind of product we built, it means these following things. And you just write it down. It's a very kind of you know, social sciences approach rather than like a fully automated thing. Um, you get an indicative story and it says, well, you tick 10 boxes, so theoretically it looks like you're probably somewhere in the range where you pass. But there's human judgment involved, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt. 
that's when the company says, okay, we're confident we can do this and we're going to be, you know, might be held li legally liable if we, if we lied here, but like we're fairly confident we, we got this right. You publish the self-assessment, it's aggregated on our website, it's published on their website on like a standardized URL. And the questions just, you know, there's going to be about 50 questions. Um, I just like picked out a few that are still kind of draft and so they're not quite the final ones. Stuff like, do you employ privacy by design best practices? What does that mean? Do you have an easy to understand privacy and data policy? Provide a link and explain in user-friendly terms what that means. A lot of this, by the way, is stuff that now is covered by GDPR as well. So every company that sells in Europe has most of these things. Just like all these questions are aligned with like a product development process that we're just testing with external launch partners to see, okay, how can we make sure that these are all things that product managers will go through anyway, they just now have an uh, occasion to actually write it down as well and be public about it. And we know from initial testing that is a thing that, that most product managers actually really enjoyed because they can take it back to their, to their bosses essentially and say, hey, um, we've been talking about this. Can we now get a final commitment on it? And it seems like it's, it's actually really helpful. Um, the checklist is available for, for reviews as well, if you want to take a look. Um, it's linked from the presentations. I can also share the link again later. Um, the way the system published, you know, just like you'd expect. Here's the thing you said you do. Here's your explanation of how that's done. And you just have a long list of these um, that are all published. We don't have to go through that in detail now. There's, um, you get the idea. Um, at this point, I would quickly hand over to Jason because he's been looking into ways of making these things legally binding and also comparing it to other areas of his work. Jason, would you take over? Sure. Thanks. Um, okay, great. Well, I only have one slide. So I'll just let you take it back over. So anyway, thanks for coming out. Um, so just to let you all know, I'm a US lawyer, so I think of it as mostly from the US perspective, although I am familiar with a lot of European law, especially the general data protection regulation that just came into effect. Um, but one of the things I've done for the last 10 years is work with a lot of open innovation communities. So open source communities for source code, but also hardware, um, some in the bio space or synthetic biology, a lot of different communities that are trying to come together around similar questions. And so one of the first questions they have if they want to label themselves open is how do we create a common interest among people who want to work in this space so we can share, so we can build something bigger than just ourselves, right? So that's one idea about openness is that. But the other part of openness, which, you know, if any of you are familiar with these communities know, is it's also about how do we be more honest and upfront and how do we let people make good choices and how do we kind of let people also be critical, right, in the right ways? Like how do we help give them the information that they need. And it's not just consumers. I mean, consumers and users are important, absolutely. But it's also other creators, right? So other people who want to innovate. Let's say, you know, I want to attract other smart people who share my values, right? This is one way to signal it is to say I'm open source or I'm this or I'm that, right? So that's one issue. One, one aspect of it is how do we be more kind of open in terms of people being able to take the technology and do a lot of things that they want to do and be more free about it? But also, how do we be more open in a sense of transparency and honesty and, and allow people to be even harsh on us if that's what they need to be? Um, so you have communities of users, you have communities of developers or creators. You also have kind of the interaction with markets and what people buy and sell in terms of competition, right? So another, thing is, another goal of kind of being open is to signal that um, you can actually fork this. You can take it where you want, and you could actually be my direct competitor as long as you follow similar kind of values, right? Like w those values get usually get set by the legal license. Like you can, you know, if you modify the code, you have to also publish the code when you distribute. Or if you're, you know, in the Creative Commons realm and I have an attribution requirement, it means that you can take my stuff, but you have to always tell people I was the person who made it and it's my contribution to your thing, right? Whatever those licenses say. Now, that's all generally done in the legal areas of copyright. Um, a little bit in patent, although not much. Um, and what's interesting is that this whole approach here, when you look at the legal landscape, it's, it's trademark law. And one of the things that I've done for a long time when I was at EFF and teaching and advocating is I always try to take intellectual property laws 
that are often used by people who are trying to be very, you know, quote unquote evil, like they're trying to lock things down or punish people or censor people and say, is there a way that we can flip it over and try and make it something that is actually a lever that we can use to open things up and make it more interesting and more accessible and more democratic in some way. And so trademarks have always been potentially that. And this is an interesting area because and that's part of why I wanted to work with Peter and, and the other folks on the project, because I do think there's potential here. So how many of you are familiar with the kosher trademark at all? Like raise your hand if you've ever heard it. So kosher, um, you know, it depends what community you come from. It's a Jewish tradition of how you prepare food. And for people who follow this tradition of the Jewish faith or not, some people just think of kosher food as good food and they want to eat it. Um, they look for these marks on the food. They go to the grocery store and they're like, does it have, this is just one, there are lots of them. Usually they have a K, but there's like an O and a U, which is very popular and a bunch of different ones, right? And they, they're kind of checking the shelves and they go, oh, okay, got it. So, and you ask people in all these surveys, like what does it mean to have something be kosher? And almost no one except like the rabbis really have any like answers. They're like, oh, it means it's good for you or it follows Jewish law or something, right? So I actually went to the U.S., trademark office website and I looked up what this kosher mark means. So if, it, if you go to the grocery store and you buy bread and it has that mark on it, what it means is it's been certified. And what does that mean? That means that it's uh, in compliance with kosher dietary food preparation and handling standards, which include the code of Jewish law as codified by this rabbi with the glossies of Moses Israelis and other authorities. In other words, who knows? Right? It's this idea that there are a bunch of people out there who are very experienced and understanding about what kosher is, and you trust them, that they wouldn't, put, they wouldn't allow any baker to put this thing on the bread unless they really meant it. And what turns out to be is that that's exactly right. So what happens in the United States, but anywhere really in the world, um, is that if you want your product to be kosher, you actually have to get a rabbi to bless it. Like That's literally the test for getting your certification mark as a trademark. Um, or you have to submit it to like the council of rabbis or there are various processes that you have to do. Now these are opaque processes. These are not transparent. These are very arbitrary processes. Um, but they are based fundamentally, if you look at them abstractly, on values. And that's what people are saying. It's like they're saying, okay, I may not know exactly what Jewish law says, but I trust that these rabbis have values that I share in some way that I'm connected to in some way, and that they're looking out for my best interest. I may not always agree, but like this mark means something right, for the people who care about kosher. And so the idea that a trademark could represent a set of values, community values, could also apply to open source, to trusted, secure, privacy, protective IoT, to fair phones, to whatever those things are. Right? If you get the right set of values and you get the right mark, and that mark becomes a symbol, you can imagine that people might start trusting that the people who are trying to help put this mark on the right things might be people who you agree with um, uh, around the values that the mark is trying to symbol, sim symbolize. So we see this kind of in the organic area, although there's a lot of controversy over what is organic or what is bio, right? There's a lot of politics and arbitrage. And we talk about the, the threat models to, this, <laughs> to the trademarks being actually trustworthy. But in general, you get it, right? When something is trying to say that it's organic or bio or whatever, that it's trying to say it's somehow, uh, if you go back to Peter's pyramid, um, it's not just that it won't kill you, it's actually supposed to be better than won't kill you. It's supposed to be actually higher quality on some level around the processes or the ingredients or various things, right? Um, what's also interesting is that you can use these certification marks to certify where something comes from or how it was made. So here in EU, um, we have a lot of geographic indicators. So the difference between like, for instance, champagne and Prosecco and Cava uh, is where it's made. Not uh, chemically, it can be identical. It can actually be a complete clone chemically. Um, but if it's made in a certain region, um, you can only call it that thing. Champagne only comes from champagne. And one of my favorite examples is feta cheese that in Europe, you can only officially call something feta cheese if it comes from Greece. If it comes from Bulgaria or Turkey or any other place, um, you have to call it white brined goat's milk cheese, that you can't use the word feta. Um, now this is of course sort of silly in a way, but what you do is you get the sense that these words can be legally enforceable in a way that means something, right? So maybe this is a joke, but also if you talk to Greek people who care about feta, it's a long historical cultural tradition. It's a set of values that they really care about that they don't want to be diluted, right? They want it to mean something in the world. 
So again, a set of values, a set of where things came from, a set of honesty about what something really is to certain people can be done through the mark. Uh, I'm not saying we do what these people did exactly, but we can think about this mark as this way of signaling what something really is supposed to be or is or a set of values that are associated with a product, right? So you buy a product like a speaker that you can you know, have voice activated. What does it mean? What are the values behind it? This is from the Open Source Hardware Association, which I'll, I should say is a client of mine in the United States. Um, and we've been working with them on certification marks for what it means to be open hardware. And they actually have a process that um, I think is um, interoperable and compatible to some degree with the Trustmark process, um, in that it's again a self-certification model that you have at least complied with the basics of being quote unquote open. So for instance, that you have an open source license associated with your schematics and that you publish your you know, schematics and you publish your or designs and you publish the license. You also publish enough documentation so someone can make it. Um, you sort of meet these requirements of bare minimum, like what it is to be open in hardware, right? And then they issue you a mark, which gives you a country code and ID number, and you put that on there. At least people in the open hardware community or anyone who cares says, okay, you've, you've ticked the boxes on the open source hardware site, so at least I know that you've done that. And what that means is another question. Um, the last example I want to do, and I do this because almost everyone hates the Motion Picture Association of America. They have very few fans, the people, Hollywood, you know, big, big Hollywood. Um, but what's interesting about this, is, and everyone also hates the rating systems, um, you know, that they put on movies, if you've you know, seen NC-17 or R or PG-13 or whatever. Um, because, of course, they are, they are a form of censorship. Absolutely. They use them to push out movies they don't like by giving them too high of a rating so people like it's like going to be too violent or something like that. But what's interesting about it is they are certification marks as well. And I went and looked up again from the website of the U.S. Trademark Office and it's like, well, what is NC-17 supposed to mean? It means, it certifies that in the opinion of, in this, of, the, of Hollywood's secret ratings board, that most American parents would consider it inappropriate for viewing by anyone under 18. Now, that's likely bullshit in most contexts, but what's interesting about it is it's completely values-based. In other words, it's trying to signal something about the values of what they think movies mean in the world. Like, they think this movie means this, like only these people should see it, and this movie means that. Now again, this is, I think most people find objectionable or sort of scary in some ways because it's about controlling culture. But one can imagine that the values that we have before values are about openness and trust and privacy and security. These kind of marks can have very similar effects. So for instance, this NC-17 mark, it's been well documented, can make the difference between a movie's success and failure just simply by having the rating on it. Certain movies have completely failed commercially because they've had NC-17, whereas if they go down to an R-rated movie, which is more acceptable, um, they'll make money. Um, and so one of the things to think about, and we can talk about this, is if these marks have this kind of power, how do we use that power responsibly? Right? What is the right responsible way to do it, and who should do it, and how distributed should it be versus concentrated? There are a lot of interesting questions about who enforces these things. But one thing I'll say, and this goes back to, the last thing I'll say, and this goes back to what Peter sort of started with, right? is that the, if the companies volunteer to get the mark, in other words, they, they voluntarily click the boxes and explain things, and then they, they opt into it, they're kind of representing to the world that they're trying to do better. And if it turns out that not by some you know, small mistake, but by real deception, they are lying, that is something that companies get sued for a lot um, in both the U United States and in Europe. Deceiving people in your marketing, making promises that you can't keep around your products is actually an area of real concern. So it is something to think about in terms of this project, and I think one of the options is for people who really want this mark, if we can make it something very valuable for them, something meaningful for them, um, it will start to distinguish because there'll be certain companies who will hesitate. Um, oh, it's okay. Um, because, and I think it will also become something where people who want to maybe contribute to a platform that develops apps for that IoT device or wants to see, well, we should decide which IoT devices we want our thing to connect to, right? It creates all these different avenues of communication um, where you can start to ask questions like, well, have you guys thought about applying for a trust mark? 
And if they go, no, well, why not? Do you think you couldn't, like, do you think maybe you can't get there? Or can we help you get there? Or, you know what, we thought it was difficult and then we did it and it actually turned out to be great. You should try it. Like, there's this way in which that kind of also, those network effects and those community effects, which we see in open source all the time, I think will really come into play. So, turn back over to Pete. Awesome, thank you. Um, I would, um, I just got a couple more slides. So how about we like go through the whole thing and then we open it up for discussion because I'm pretty sure there's like quite a bunch of questions. So um, just very briefly, um, we're always looking for partnerships and for people who help out with this stuff. Uh, we're looking for some academic partners. We're looking for also in case you're building a product, we'd like you to, we'd love you to like come in and actually kick the tires on this project. That'd be great. Um, we'll be there and there will be no public shaming if anything goes wrong. At least we won't shame you, you can shame us, that's fine. Um, and of course, like media partners would also always be, be great to like help us once we're there to like push things out. Um, but also just uh, to tie it back into like the larger like realm of what happens at ThinksCon, we have a few things coming up. There's a, in a couple of weeks, there's a ThinksCon salon in Cologne, which should be great. Um, but also, and that's a real, real blast. Um, our partners in Amsterdam are putting on another field trip to Shenzhen. Shenzhen is uh, the place in China where almost all the hardware worldwide is made. Like 89% of the global hardware probably is made there. Um, it's going to be just about a week where you can just like, you know, see the factory, see the design houses. Um, we've done this twice before and it was amazing. Um, and I think there still have a few seats um, on this trip. Um, and then like in December, we're going to have like the big annual get together in Rotterdam this time, where it's like the big, you know, global community comes together. And all this is uh, listed on thingscon.com. Um, trustabletech.com is where you can find this presentation and what, you know, all the stuff that comes out of it, all the links, things on commerce can re where you can find out all the events. Um, on that note, I would wrap up the presentation part. We have a beautiful throwable microphone. I love these. Um, and so we can just have a discussion because I'm sure there's like a lot of opinions and questions about this. And I get a visual signal from the AVT. Um, is it, yeah, if that's okay. Yeah, sure, why not? Cool, thank you. Um, so we're both here for, um, you know, for questions, but also if you just have opinions, feedback, things that couldn't work, things we might have not, uh, might have missed. I'm sure there are a bunch. Um, there you go. Uh, very small, is the microphone, yeah? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, I got a small question. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm working on secure elements. So I got it wrong. I was not sure that's not about blockchain, but it's about Internet of Things, what I'm working to. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a little bit different topic. Uh, there, one of your idea is that the user must be able to retrieve his personal data out of the product. This might be actually, in some respects, contradictory to security to one of your other points. For example, if we are going to the Con most condensed hardware involved in security, which is more or less secure element, smart card chip or whatever. There, the core idea is that it's dedicated, uh, developed in a way that's simply not possible to retrieve your personal information, especially your private key from the PKI concept out of the smart card, because this is a sense of a smart card, would be contradictory. More, more, uh, even, even more. Uh, these uh, elements are uh, developed in a way that the private key will be generated on board of the card and has no chance to leave the smart card. Um, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, there's there's certainly going to be edge cases, and like in almost any discussion, whenever you introduce the blockchain, you're going to hit some really interesting um, edge cases, and that's certainly one of them. Um, I don't have a solution for that yet, but uh, like I think there's like a 80-20 divide there. Yeah. No, I think it's a good example to think that, so one of the problems, of course, if those of you who work in the IoT space is that it's so hard to describe the boundaries of any of these spaces, right? It's like a very constantly dynamic evolving thing. And so one of the challenges I think that you have to confront is like the minute you decide what things are, they will change, right? Like it's so hard. So what I liked about this model was that there's a descriptive element to each, right? So you might think of this as a place where you could also, and I wouldn't have any lawyers go near this, write distinguishing or dis 
disclaiming aspects of it, right? So you might say, what, what do we mean by that? What I mean by you can get your personal data is like, yeah, like if you've uploaded all of your songs and all this other stuff, or you, you know, you've tracked all your DMs or PMs with friends and things like that. Like in other words, you, the manufacturer or the, the vendor or whatever could say in that box what they mean. And what that does is it doesn't, it's not about guarantees, right? It's not about, this is not like inf a contract that you enforce so much as that it's about a signal to consumers and to other developers and to marketplaces what they get. And going back to Peter's thing about what you expect, right? So if you have this in there that says, you should not expect to extract your private key out of the secure enclave or whatever it is, but you should expect that, yeah, like all the, you know, all the messages you exchange via this voice activated speaker, you might be able to get back out if you, you know, under these conditions or not, right? Um, and so I think that's much more about kind of giving people clear information about what they can and cannot expect. Um, and at least so for me, you know, you could question, well, do they then get to tick the box? But I think what happens in a lot of these things, and again, this is very common in open source, is people screw up all the time. They do the wrong things. And then there's a conversation, right, hopefully, about, well, maybe you know, it happens in secure with responsible disclosure and, you know, you know, well, you're going to patch that? You misconfigured it. Like, you should do this. Or So I think these conversations are, are more likely to be the outcomes as opposed to completely accurate disclosures and completely enforceable, um, you know, tick boxes. And there's, there's one more small thing that um, I didn't point out specifically earlier because it's just already, already there's so much detail to take in. Um, we structured the feedback, the, the questionnaire in a way just based on very early prototypes um, in a way that says like, yes, we do that. No, we don't or not applicable. And then just like explain why it doesn't apply in that case. And that's probably one where you would say like, this does not apply to us and then we can take it out of the scoring essentially. Hello. Uh, so uh, I guess this is more of a comment than a question, if that's OK. So my, my concern is, is that this is a very good model when consumers, and I'm assuming it's designed for, for consumer IoT, not other ones, uh, when consumers are making a conscious choice, either a purchase decision or an interaction decision or something along those lines. Uh, however, when, when I look at the current trend in technology and where we're going to be, not just in five years, but maybe 10 or, or 15, I think that this element of consumer choice starts to melt away. And uh, especially outside of the home, but even into the home. If you move into an apartment, you don't make a choice about what light switches are installed or what electrical sockets are installed. Uh, but in the panopticon of connected devices, uh, it's very likely that you will move into a house with thousands of connected uh, devices. And this sort of transition from a few fairly expensive things with brands towards uh, a multitude of anonymous generic devices, which may also be uh, collecting data or doing who knows what, uh, I don't see how that works together with the trust mark or how you can accomplish your goals of the trust mark in a world where that is the, the method of interaction with connected devices. Right. You raise really, really good points. Like if you look at, you know, so like, you know, a lot of new buildings, especially in Asia, uh, where you move in and like you said, everything's like pre-installed and it's fully connected and you're in one ecosystem rather than another. Um, that's the part that we probably wouldn't tackle. Like we built this for now. And the next, you know, the next few years, um, I think for a long time there's still going to be consumer choice, even if it moves to these like more integrated solutions. I guess the best case scenario would be that you pick like, oh, here's the prospectus for the building that's going to go up there that I'm going to move into in two years' time. They use all the certified stuff rather than the non-certified stuff. But I mean, that's a that's a big leap. But in between, there's a few years where we still have some choice. Uh, hopefully, it'll last a lot longer. I know that you're in favor of it, but it's it's a really good, uh, you know. Thanks for the setup. <laughs> Just two quick things to add. Um, I mean, it's an interesting question, right? Because we have these standards for buildings with lead, you know, platinum, gold. You know, like you can, you, you've seen this in sort of energy consumption areas, right? It's possible, I haven't thought it through, right? That you could also have smart homes or parts of smart cities where the, 
let's say the local government is considering putting out a bid, is this an aspect of the bid they put out for which government, which vendor helps them build whatever grid they want to build or whatever, you know, on the train system or things like that, right? So there are ways in which values can come into that. And if you give government procurement people a standard, which is I want to see this mark on something, then they can see about getting to it. The other thing I want to say, though, is that... Um, and this is, I have to say, I'm, I'm an AI skeptic, even though I work a lot in machine learning and AI, you know, about how intelligent anything is. But on the other hand, one of the big pushes is to have these agents, right? So we have Siri, Cortana, all these things, Alexa, whatever. And it's possible that, you know, if these things are machine readable, that you could say, well, can you at least tell me if any of the devices here or in this building or whatever follow the trust mark or not or like in other words in other words there might be a mapping kind of that at least alerts people hey well then you can't trust any of the devices in this building right um and whether maybe that becomes too dystopian and depressing but you know there might be uh, an opportunity then to have these agents at least tracking kind of what the risk factors are right so it's also there is a consumption piece of i buy this but there's also just this sort of situational awareness piece right um, like you might be worried about things like, you know, um, crime, or you might be worried about things like other things. Well, maybe this is something you worry about. And you can even tell your little agent, hey, don't let my phone connect to anything that doesn't have a trust mark and, unless I say so like twice. Like in other words, you could set your security levels or other levels based on this too, right? And you may eventually opt in, like maybe you have no choice. But I do think that's another thing where consumers and users and people can become more aware of the issue at least. So they understand that like we live in a pretty untrustworthy space um or at least i'm putting all my trust in you know big co who makes this building and and i don't have any real agency in it and again i worry about that getting too depressing but on the other hand part of what we hope for is this generates new avenues of people speaking up and demanding better um things from whoever's providing them um hello um thanks for the talks um my question is about um uh, the quality of the products because I come from a company enterprise perspective and I was thinking during the talk like would would I join this would I do this I mean you mentioned like uh, maybe you, we are legal uh, we have legal liabilities and then we have to guarantee our standards everything which are quite flexible as you just said <laughs> like maybe we can take out a dimension but um, in general um, why should I buy this from a consumer perspective? If the consumer asks, I mean, the signs and the labels, there's a sort of inflation of labels in, in general in the supermarket as well. Sometimes they produce their own labels uh, for quality uh, to get more marketing benefits out, out of it. But now with the electronics, um, Internet of Things, so, I mean, in general, after Snowden, everything is not secure and nothing is safe and will ever be safe again so this is like the whole paranoia is everywhere i mean i can fully get this like it's maybe it's more open source maybe it's maybe it's more secure or maybe we give them a hard time with their billions of dollars to crack my refrigerator but in the end i mean yes are there like quality um, assurances which go like he asked for years but I mean how are they enforceable I mean like this I want this I want an open source spirit I mean yeah I want an open source but I buy, buy a product that is maybe open source maybe in a couple of years there will be another firmware great I mean I don't get it really I do not get the, the point the whole argument of like the why should I buy this so uh it's really hard to find any open source IoT device. There's like, there's, except for the DIY space, it essentially doesn't exist because investors won't invest currently in open source hardware. It just like, just like empirically, basically doesn't happen. So as nice as that would be, personally, I would be all in favor of this, but this is not happening. Uh, what we're trying to do here is to move beyond, like security is just one out of five dimensions for that reason. Like it's never going to be perfect security, but you can, you know, make sure it's at least, you know, they're trying really hard. But there's also other aspects, including like privacy, but also you know, um, transparency. To just generally speaking, right now there's nothing. All you have as a consumer is price and features, and that's all. There is there's no really meaningful label currently. Um, we hope we can build an alternative that's better than what's out there now. Well, 
And I think it's actually might be a good opportunity to like open it up. Just, I mean, part of the feedback we need is would this ever make a difference in what you guys buy or use? Like maybe, the, you know, would you be like, nah, in the end, I'll just take whatever I can get. So, I mean, I kind of put the question more to all of you, like just to think about, because yeah, we know what we do, but um, I think some of you, but I will say this too, that like, um, I do think that um, often you, you don't, like Snowden's actually a great example you don't see the effect of these things until the crisis moment hits when people freak out and they want to know what the alternative is, right? So I think we've seen this in a couple of different places, but like with Uber, there've been a bunch of, there were a bunch of series of stories where people hashtag delete Uber, right? Um, kind of like, oh, I got to get it off Uber because it's doing whatever I don't like. It's sexist, it's toxic, it's horrible to labor, it's you know bad for privacy. They were tracking lots of people, right? And the fact that Lyft, had already committed to not doing a bunch of those things at various degrees, at least convinced some people to switch, right? But it was also like, well, is Lyft really any different? Or is this other, or is my taxi any different? Or what? Like, you know, there was these questions of like, is switching to a different provider actually making any difference? And I guess one of the things you can hope for is that this mark would symbolize, yes, on some level, that switching is at least going with it. So, you know, if you care deeply enough in the moment of like, oh, I'm freaking out right now, um, maybe you would have an alternative and know that alternative means something different. So that might be maybe the moment when we see something happen, um, not so much the moment when you're like on Amazon trying to pick whichever of the 50 things they're offering. But I'd be curious, yeah, for anyone who is here, would this ever make a difference in your purchasing or using of a device? Or is it kind of like, eh, nice, but whatever? <clears throat> I, okay, I think you're totally right that there's a lot of bullshit with labels. Uh, but I think I know some valid labels and I know invalid labels, and some I don't really know. And I think a label from Mozilla, I probably would trust a little bit more than others. Um, Legal reasons, I should interject that currently it's not a label by Mozilla. Uh, okay, so, uh, I, I somehow connected to Mozilla. Support, uh, supported by, but uh, not currently uh, officially uh, supported, uh, you know, enforced by. And I think with this connection, there are two factors. So it looks like this, these people care about something that Mozilla does, so that's positive for me. And if they mess with Mozilla and really do bullshit, this is a shitstorm for them. So this makes it a little bit more probable that they behave well. So it's not, not a guarantee, but I think for me it would somehow be, be yeah, relevant in some way. Um, another point I really think that's important is the machine readability. That, um, so if you have some kind of price comparison portals and then you have some kind of uh, free text rating that they can't use it if you have make it easy for them to to make their offering more valuable and by by they can take this information for free put it next to it and then they have more information than others and something um, this machine readability of of this trust map and maybe differentiated so this and that and that factor that would be really helpful. So, if we're looking at how Creative Commons does just machine readable tags to make it easier to aggregate, for example, there's something there. You, and you. So here's an. Seems perfect device. until now. <laughs> Uh, I just like the idea with this uh, label and trademark. I guess it's a, it's a good idea and very might be very useful in the future. Um, a few points. Uh, it consists now of five different flavors, uh, or how you call it, characteristics or dimensions. 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 Yeah, okay, dimensions, um, uh, which is uh, quite okay. However, I think it might be very difficult to define the content of dimensions. So if we come back to this issue, security. Everybody would understand something different, security state of the art. Uh, so it's very hard to define. So I would propose that you make within these four dimensions or five dimensions, <coughs> if you would add inside flavors. So that means that you would have a larger market for the trademark because you would have it more scalable, but it would be transparent. So, for security, one for security. I mean, no, I mean, if you go inside security, 
uh, might be something okay uh, secure because of secure because of yeah because it's not the same password for for every router for example yeah A preset yeah so this might be something of course needs to be defined in a, in a in a more in a more general way yeah so not so not so technically specific uh, and this actually like for all of these five characteristics uh, so to impose different flavors inside, make it publishable, of course, which is not a big issue, because it's more simpler to say uh, it's secure with this type of aspect than to assure that's completely secure. It would be arbitrary. It would be just something which is very difficult to assess and just a matter of taste, a matter of policy and politics as well. Yeah. So who is going to decide about it? Yeah, that's in this case, that's easy. From and the beginning, it's us. Absolutely. Yes. So I, I, I would just make it finer, actually. I, I, I endorse, really, the idea. Uh, and I would, on the other hand, I would even add something. I was A year ago, I was discussing with, um, with a member of the Ministry of Trade, uh, some uh, director which who is responsible for regulations. We have been discussing about issuing a label or trademark uh, which will cover social aspects for IT. That means some certain type of uh, avoiding child labor and blah, 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 yeah, these, these type of things. So it might be a good thing to, to add a sixth characteristic. I mean, it's not my topic, it's not my major topic, but I think it might be reasonable. Uh, some uh, companies, uh, even China, would... Uh, appreciate this, yeah. Is if they have some way to differentiate themselves for higher quality of work and higher quality of wages, yeah. yeah so yeah, I mean, it's not my it's not my my political topic. So I'm I'm really not in that direction. But but it's I think it's a real. It's a, I think it's I think it's a reasonable uh, a reasonable demand from people to have mm -hmm. to to survive. <laughs> Thank you, JP. Thanks. Um, I'm, I have a comment and a, and a question. I'm actually um, regarding the comment. Um, I think you're absolutely right about the vacuum. Um, so if we look at the vacuum being uh, that there's n nothing else right now that people can kind of trust in or kind of have a proxy to estimate how trustworthy the device or the company is. Um, if we look at the uh, European Union, uh, we have right now two regulations in place that might be... Um, targeted towards IT improving IT security. That would be the European Cybersecurity Act, uh, which should be finalized this year, or the um, radio equipment directive that um, could happen at some point, but nobody knows. Um, and if you follow the process, you know that at least in, for the next two or three years, there will be no European certified product on the market, simply because the regulation will end this year after that the certification process has to be established, after that the um, companies have to adopt. So you know already from today that you have easily another three years until we have something like European certified products. And even then, based on the um, dominant scheme right now, the European uh, Cybersecurity Act, it will be voluntarily and uh, already how it's planned Right now, it's um, kind of a mess in terms of figuring out what it actually means in the end. So a lot of the thought um, that uh, you put into your questions, I feel like the, at least right now the European regulators um, didn't do in, in their process. So that would be the encouraging comment. Um, the, the, the question, or do, do you? I just want to say a very wise man once told me off record that the current IT security or IoT related security certificates are just garbage. <laughs> And to water it down, so that's well, what inspired. Well, maybe maybe not, not maybe not garbage, but I mean the the thing is it's it's not it's actually not a fixed uh, security uh, certification scheme. So the, right now they just decided who should be responsible and who should do what, so that in a couple of years we might have some schemes. Um, but um, you mentioned uh, Jason the um, open source hardware um, certification, and um, I read a couple of days ago that um, Apple is, was losing a court case in Norway about um, a third-party repair service for their, um, for the iPhone. Uh, so that kind of connected in my head at least the right-to-repair movement, which is especially predominant in the U.S., um, and the, the mark. Um, so that um, do you see a chance that 
maybe in the future or already in their questions, the mark could also be an indicator uh, that you have a right to repair and that you have actually the necessary information um, to repair your device after the service stopped. The answer is yes. I, so I think there'll be, I mean, we're still, this is still a work in progress. So I think any of these suggestions that anyone would have, for, again, they're, they're related, which is if there's a question which you want the manufacturer to make a commitment on, something that would make a difference for you, um, that's a good question to tell us about because <laughs> we can then play with it and see if it will fit into a dimension. Um, what, For instance, one of the things, and this is coming from the United States, which is in the United States we have had part of the work I've always done is defending people who um, uh, take apart devices or you know experiment with them or innovate with them or modify them, et cetera, who get then sued or at least there's a threat of suit by the manufacturer. Um, or researchers who will research a device and then there's a threat of lawsuit because we love to sue in the United States. But one of the things that I was imagining, which we could think about, is a commitment not to sue any researchers or you know, people or hackers or whatever you want to call them, like a group or any user who buys a device um, for trying to make that device better or researching it or understanding it or getting it repaired. In other words, there could be a kind of like commitment not to sue that, um, uh, that essentially is a right to repair because you've pre-committed that you're not going to object. Mm. So I do think there's a connection we can work on there. I haven't thought through the exact legal language, but I think it's possible. Is there anyone who hasn't talked to you wants to jump in? I'm, I'm happy to keep going, but also always want to make sure if there are other folks who've been waiting. Okay. Oh, yeah. So uh, my question is about the trust issue. And, uh, actually, personally, I think trust issue, trust issue is particular, uh, particularly a generation problem. Because if you talk with my grandfather, then probably he's not going to post his pictures to Facebook and just talk about its security and privacy. But now we just post everything there, and still we have kind of concern about security. And we have the next generation coming through with Instagram, and they just post it on Instagram when they are just two or three, even just new words. So like, then maybe next generation is not going to have any kind of concerns about tr trust at all, and then they will just concentrate on the useful features of all these technologies, and they don't really care about trust. And so it's going to be maybe another world of like concepting all those stuff. So uh, I was just curious about your opinion about this. So I think there's like always an, a thing where every generation has to redefine, you know, find over time what they trust and don't trust, and what the risk assessment is. Uh, social media certainly has been an interesting case in like I guess our age group and just you know one you know half generation below or whatever. Um, I think it's just a different threat model, but also I would argue that most likely it also depends a lot on your demographics. If you're poor, vulnerable, maybe maybe a woman that might already change dramatically what you post on Instagram. Um, then if you know you're like a white man who works in tech, for example, um, because then you have no fear in the world. Like there's, you know, there's no real risk model there. Like that's as pronounced as like any vulnerable population. Um, so that there's a part of this, um, but also um, I'd like to not take too much of a risk on this. I'd like to fix the current problems rather than hoping that they just go away in a generation. I see your point. Like it's a really good point, but um, I think there's enough now that we need to fix rather than just wait. And. So one of the interesting things about this, so, the, so the, there are empirical studies, by the way, that show um, a lot of what Peter just said, that um, even millennials and young people who seem to be much more comfortable sharing, um, if they have a bad experience with sharing online, they immediately will change all their sharing practices to be much more conservative and private. Um, not all of them, but many of them. And so sometimes we learn from experience, right? So it's so hard to predict what will be what our future self will want <laughs> and when we will want it right so it's so this crisis moment that i talked about like when facebook and cambridge analytica and all that data that you know for those who people who cared about how their data on facebook might have been used in elections or in other kind of ways right that was a crisis moment did they have anywhere to go no most of them stayed on facebook because there's nowhere else to go right um yes you can change your privacy setting a little bit whatever but um, so, so it's this combination of also trying to create the future possibilities. And maybe, yeah, maybe no one will ever care, right? But if they do, if there's a crisis moment and they care, can they act? Is there a, a way to go? And so part of this is, yeah, we're being a little bit of, I think, dreamers 
a little, which is not so bad. But yeah, I think, I think you have to set up the possibilities in some ways and see if anyone bites in the future and what their future selves will want. But I think if you don't have options, then what appears to be acceptance is actually just um, uh, dominance by the powerful over those who have no choices or few. And uh, just one more. So uh, I don't know whether there is such a concept, but uh, so you said the verification process is by the company itself, and they just verify their uh, own product. And can you do this uh, like a peer review as, as it does in academia, and then probably those companies like to kill, kill each other, uh, and they just like fight over all these verification processes, find the missing points, and then I don't know, if, so maybe it's like much more bulk proof because if you look at the verification process, then even it is like enforced by the state, there are companies like Volkswagen who can just hack it out. And then basically you might have this like peer uh, review process, maybe much more stronger. I like the Hunger Games approach. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's actually the first time someone has brought this up. I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about um, a peer review um, system for this. We thought about like all kinds of like you know we might have you know a core of volunteers who work with companies or whatever. Um, the most, what I hear most often is why why isn't there just a certified body in the middle where experts evaluate that? And that's the part I can answer. Like nobody has found a way to do that at all. Not even like at a high cost point. Just nobody has found a way to do it because it's very. I don't like the term, but it's almost very holistic. It like, looks at a lot of different things. It's really tricky to evaluate these things. Um, the peer review, it's an interesting approach. Hadn't, hadn't really thought about this, so. Uh, no, I just, I'd say, so there, you know, there's these things, so in open source, typically you fork before you, like in other words, that's the kind of move you make. You're like, if you don't like what someone's doing, you don't really kind of go hardcore against them. Maybe you do a little bit on the discussion list, but then you're like, well, then I'll just move my, I'll just go over here and I'll do this project, right? In open source hardware, it's been interesting, right? Because you've had these projects that have so much momentum and the cost structures, it's not just a fork on the code, you gotta have suppliers and circuits and everything, and right? And so, so IoT is an interesting place to think about well, who are the peers and who are the competitors and, you know, I think you can get there, but I think it's a little unclear. You'd have to have enough um, interest in competition, right? You have to have a competitive environment I think, and then you have to have a place to bring the answers. And so one of the things that we've seen happen recently a lot um, is activity where people go and they advocate to Amazon, where they say, this product is defective, it's hurting people, it's bad, you should take it off your, um, MF, your platform and only allow other products, including mine, you know, like that, the kind of advocacy to eBay, Amazon, whoever, you know, Alibaba, like those actually could be also interesting um, potential arenas for peer review in a sense of that. I think if the peers say to the platform, you don't want to be associated with this product, it's too risky, or they're saying this thing, but it's a bunch of lies. That happens all the time anyway, but if you had a like framework for presenting it, like we went through and we tested all the things they ticked the box on and they're lying on nine out of 10 things and here's the proof, here's our report, it could be persuasive. Um, yeah, and also like just just building on on that and like how they can just go through this list. We've seen in like the last four or five years that we've done ThingsCon that people like take these these things, you know, these lists, these checklists, these manifestos. They take them into their work, and especially if you work in an agency or you're a product developer, you can like take that to your boss or to your client, and you say like, hey, here's the thing. We think it's gonna help us, you know, reputation wise. It's just the right thing to do, and. It's amazing how many stories are heard of people who like came into a meeting and said, well, it's kind of a bad idea. Can we not just do it that way? We were like, oh yeah, nobody cares. We didn't even think about it. Just like do what you think is right. Like it's amazing how often that happens just because everybody works on time pressure. So if this checklist helps you go through like a, a process and guides you through a thing that you don't just like evaluate in hindsight, but it, you can take into account as you're designing your product and make all these decisions. Um, I think this could just like you know, help you have a smoother product development process, and also lead to a much better, much better outcome. Um, it's just like a very hands-on kind of tool you can use every day. JP. 
Just two thoughts on the uh, peer review process. I think it's uh, because it's so holistic, it actually would be tricky, just like you said. But if you break it down to the t dimensions, um, I think it's uh, you, easily since you target the kind of top tier um, providers who are already dedicated, um, probably you all also find like-minded people for the peer review. And then you have experts for... Um, data practices and, and privacy, you have experts for um, security um, aspects and, and so on. So um, I, I think if you if you break it down to also manageable work packages for any reviewer so that I don't have, as a security expert, I don't have to care about transparency or, or, or data practices. I just focus on the, um, um, on the statements from the security um, questioning uh, of the company. Um, then I think it would be actually manageable. And um, especially looking at privacy, we now have um, privacy bots um, um, that kind of automatically read uh, the, the privacy statements of companies and, and uh, mark uh, questionable uh, answers. So you can probably, in the next step, you could also think about what are, chance, uh, what are possibilities to automate um, the that, uh, going through these uh, questions and, and how the company answers them. Yeah, thank you. Also, I feel there's like a, the answers are getting slower and it's getting warmer in here. Should we like break off this part and we can still mingle outside? There's like fresh drinks in the, in the fridge. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank you for your input. Thank you so much and for all your contributions. <laughs> and then we can uh, leave this awkward gap and just like mingle around the tables out there. Thank you. <laughs>